Why hello there! Welcome back! This is part 11 of my build log of the Trumpeter 1-200 scale model of the Titanic. Uh, in this episode, I'm not going to be covering a huge amount of new ground, because instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to look back and try to explain how I've arrived at a lot of the component choices that I've made for this model. Um, my reasoning here is because over the last couple of videos, uh, I've watched them back, and I've also had quite a lot of comments from people asking for clarification on things, and it did just occur to me that I've managed to cover quite a lot of ground without really explaining how I arrived at the decisions I've arrived at. So with that in mind, uh, in this video I'm going to talk through how I worked out what components I was going to fit into the boat, um, also how I worked out where they're going to be spaced and how the boat's going to be balanced correctly. I'll also go into much greater depth on my electronics, um, and then I'll also talk through some of the um, some of the things that I have made progress on since the last video. So, without any further ado, I shall crack on. But before I crack on, I've had quite a few comments from people asking how they get their hands on the Pontos upgrade set. Um, so, the answer to that is, when you buy the Trumpeter kit, there's a flyer inside it, uh, and that gives you details of how you buy the Pontos kit. It's basically a sort of snazzy flyer shows you what you get in the kit and on the reverse side it tells you exactly how to buy it and it I've got to say it does feel a little bit dodgy if I'm honest you've got to email an email address um, and they send you back a PayPal request for some money and um, it all it does feel a little bit strange but to be fair to them um, they are pretty hot on it um, I think I, I got my kit something like four days after I paid, so they are pretty good. And now that I've got that out of the way, I will crack on. So for anyone who's made a model boat before, you'll know that one of the first things that you realise is that space is of an absolute premium in a project like this. And there's a few reasons for that. F firstly, just because inherently you don't have much space in a model boat. But um, a much more important reason is because anything you have that is heavy absolutely has to go as far down in the hull as possible. Uh, and the reason for this is that by having weight lower down in the hull, you'll lower the centre of gravity of the ship, and therefore you'll have a significantly more stable craft than you otherwise would. Um, and that goes a long way to defining how you lay out your components anyway. So the first thing I did to work out which components I'd select and how they'd be laid out was to create a CAD model of Titanic. So I used Titanic's original plans from Sea Deck and the Orlop Deck and lofted them together to create a model. Then through knowing Titanic's length and through knowing the, the actual scale of the model I'm working with, I was able to scale the CAD model down. So I was working with a 3D model that is the exact same shape as the model I'm physically going to end up with. Where I was unsure about dimensions, I erred on the side of caution and underestimated, so this is the smallest space that I will ever realistically be working with. And what this allowed me to do, even before I bought the kit or any other components, is it allowed me to sort of drag and drop and plonk components down into the hull to see how much space I'd actually be dealing with. Um, and this is why I think CAD is so powerful, because before having to commit to any form of expenditure, you can work out if your project's actually going to work. Um, and it's important to remember that not all components are the same in terms of their space requirements. You know, things like a battery pretty much just need the space that they will physically take up. Um, but other components, for example motors, it's quite sensible to leave a clearance around them because firstly they need airflow across them to cool them down, but also they're moving parts. Um, so there's a potential that other things may snag on them. Another good example in my model is the smoke generator. There's a heating element inside that, so by definition it's going to get hot so you don't want it in too close a proximity to other components but also it requires a fairly substantial volume of air above the device to allow it to generate enough smoke and if it doesn't have that the heating element inside will likely burn out and you'll end up knackering a fairly expensive piece of equipment. So I started trying out various different components in the hull to see what would work. I'm not going to show you all the different components that I tried to fit into this hull because I went through a lot. I mean, I went through probably about 30 odd different types of batteries before settling on the ones that I eventually chose. But I will show you what I finally decided on. So I worked out that 
a specific type of lead acid battery would fit quite snugly into the hull like you can see here. The other powerful thing about this program is that you can assign a weight to these batteries and what this allows you to do is it allows you to work out the centre of gravity of the collective assembly which means that you can pretty much work out whether your boat's actually going to be stable and I think that again is such a powerful piece of piece of information to have before you even start building. It's incredibly useful. I then worked out that there would be a nice aperture between two of the batteries to fit my very small but quite powerful smoke generator. And then at the end, of course, the motors close to the propeller shafts are able to fit in quite nicely like that. And the arrangement there allows for a decent portion of airflow across them, whilst also allowing an area behind the motors for some of the electronics. I've also been careful to leave a reasonable amount of space behind the motors on these solder tabs. And the reason for that is that these motors are going to have wires coming off them, and it's important to remember that you mustn't violate wire bending radiuses, because if you do, you're going to end up with premature failures as well. So you need to leave enough space for your wire bending radiuses and your wire routing generally. Another really useful thing that this model's been able to show me in advance of building, by chopping it in half, I was able to see the height to which all components would reach when they were mounted in the base of the hull. Um, and I was able to work out that all of these components sit quite comfortably below the level of the lowest row of portholes. And so this is really useful for my lighting system, because what it means is that none of these components are going to block any light shining out through the portholes. When it came to actually specifying components though, I did do more than just use my CAD model. Um, and my thought processes here were in some parts down to what I'd used in the past, but also just by reading up and researching. So for example, the MFA motors, I've used these before a lot of times, and I think they're really, really good motors. They're quite compact, um, but they do churn out a decent amount of power. Um, they're also, as far as I've found, the best small model boat range of motors, but with a decent variety of gearbox attachments on them. I think this particular model here, the uh, the 950D series, that came with about four or five different options for gearboxes, and I do think that's a really useful thing to have. Um, other things, for example, like the uh, speed controller, I've used the Mtronics Viper Marine controllers before, and I do think they are a really good product. Uh, they're waterproof, which is really useful. Um, they are... I think they're pretty efficient. It's difficult to work out exactly how efficient they are, but I find them to be pretty efficient and they don't seem to have any issues with overheating, which is quite impressive when you think they are. They're, they're switching a, a decent amount of power considering their size. You know, that's that's my index finger up against it. They're not, it's not a big, chunky device and it's powering three motors. Um, the smoke generators as well. These were things that I'd not really worked with much before. I've only used the... Um, miniature sort of Graupner 6 volt smoke generators before, but I'd heard really good things about these Harbour model smoke generators, particularly just in terms of how much smoke they actually kick out. Um, so with this particular component, I was really drawn, drawn to it based on the physical size. It's really small, nice and tiddly. Um, also, it's running time without any maintenance. It is able to run for about two hours when you fill it up full of smoke fluid, which is brilliant. That means that I don't need to sort of take the boat apart halfway through a sailing to fill it up with smoke fluid. Um, and also just the fact that it seems to be a really nice piece of kit and it's been well reviewed. So I'm looking forward to trying that in the actual boat. And I mean, to be fair, these things kick out a hell of a lot of smoke. I tried this in my living room not all that long ago now, and I really wish I hadn't because it filled the entire bloody room with smoke in under a minute. It was It was quite catastrophic, really smoke alarm going off everything is great um, so I think that's probably been quite a good purchase I think the hardest thing to work out what to buy is probably the batteries and the reason for that is there's just so much selection you know there's different chemistries of battery and within each of those different chemistries you've got different sizes different voltages yada 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 um, I went for lead acid batteries in the end these are about as simple as you can get in a battery um, they are undoubtedly the cheapest, um, and the reason I like these is because they're able to kick out a hell of a lot of current. Um, there's a reason that these are used in car batteries and stuff, and the reason is that they can kick out enough current to turn over your motor. 
Um, so, but they're less good in a lot of other respects. Things like lithium ion and even nickel cadmium are much better in terms of um, power to weight and that sort of stuff. Uh, but lead acid is cheaper. And if you look after them correctly, they can last a long time. And note what I say there, if you look after them correctly. So all batteries uh, are quite susceptible to what's called deep discharge. So if you discharge a battery all the way down to zero volts, you incur an amount of lasting damage on it. And lead acid batteries are particularly susceptible to this. So normally when you design a circuit with a lead acid battery, you don't design it for the battery to run all the way down to zero volts. I've seen some people design circuits where they only anticipate the battery will get discharged down to 80%. Um, and the idea of that is that you then are, you're greatly increasing the amount of life you can expect from your lead acid battery. Uh, I've done some calcs using three off of these lead acid batteries. I reckon that I could discharge these down to 50% during a running session and that would give me about an hour and a half's worth of running based on 70% utilisation of my motors and having the smoke and lighting on at all times. And I'm quite happy with that. Going by that rationale, these motors will, excuse me, these batteries will last the best part of two, two and a half years. So I'm pretty happy with that. Um, the other thing I like about them is that they come in a, a wide variety of different sizes. And this particular design, it's nice and thin and it's quite long, which is ideal for Titanic, because this can sit nice and low in the boat, far below the waterline, but also has a good amount of power. The other thing that a lot of people do with lead acid batteries, which really knackers them, is that they leave them discharged um, for a long period of time, and that leads to something called sulfation. Um, the correct thing to do with a lead acid battery is to, the moment you finish with it, is to charge it back up to 100%. And once it's, uh, once it's charged, it'll sit there quite happily charged, waiting to go again. But what normally happens is that people use their boat, take it home, pop it away, and then they only charge up their batteries before they next run it. And that's how you really wreck your batteries. You know, if you've ever left your car uh, and gone away on holiday and come back to find that your battery's knackered, that's the reason. It's because it's been left discharged for too long and sulfation has occurred on the terminals. So... That's some of the rationale behind the component selection that I've gone for. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is my circuit diagram. Um, and a few people have asked me questions about this, so I thought it'd be worthwhile putting the circuit diagram in a video so that people can actually see it properly. Um, so working from left to right, we start off with three 12 volt batteries in parallel. Um, now, one of the things that I haven't been able to work out from my use of CAD is how the superstructure will affect the balance of the ship and the weight of the ship. So my contingency plan there is that if the ship becomes too heavy when I have the superstructure on top of it, I can remove one of those 12 volt batteries and operate with two 12 volt batteries rather than three. So that's a bit of contingency planning I've already built in. The next step along from that is uh, the RC switch. Um, now this is what I showed in the last video, that's the sort of key fob that locks and unlocks the boat. Um, and the idea of this is that it totally separates the supply batteries from any of the electronics. So this allows me to, once I've got the boat by the bank of the river, I can simply use my key fob and connect the batteries into the circuit without having to dismantle the boat. And you'll notice that that is powered by its own 12 volt battery, and that's to protect the fairly delicate radio electronics from any sort of ripple or spikes that might come from the motors when they are rotating or from back EMF when they are slowing down. Um, next along we have the 15 amp fuse and this is the main fuse for the entire boat. This protects the wires and all other uh, circuitry before the main three components and I've rated that at 15 amps. The first branch that we come to is the smoke generator branch. I fuse that at 5 amps because the smoke generator should pull um, one, uh, sorry, two and a half amps at full capacity uh, and that is run via an RC switch which will allow me to turn the smoke generator on and off from the bank. 
Um, the next branch is identical. It's the branch for the lighting. Again, run through an RC switch. This time fused at 2 amps because the lighting will pull significantly less current through. And the final branch is the motor branch, and I've fused that at 10 amps. The ESC, or electronic speed controller, is rated to 15 amps. So the 10 amp fuse adequately protects that. And you'll notice that there are three motors being fed from that. The first two motors are the wing propeller motors, and the final motor is the central propeller motor. And you'll notice that there's a diode placed across that. Now what this diode is there for is to stop it being able to reverse. The Titanic central propeller was non-reversible. And I went into a bit more detail than that on the last episode. Um, but for a bit of historical accuracy, I don't want my central propeller to be reversible either. So by putting the diode in the way, that will ensure that current can only flow one way through that motor, meaning that it'll only be able to operate in forward. So that's a nice sort of simple circuit diagram. You'll notice that I've left off all the radio control side of the circuit. And that's because that's the side of stuff that I haven't actually designed myself. That's the things that I've just managed to buy online. So this is my first actual test of the electronics. Uh, got my cup of tea. That's good. So um, motors are now all in place along with the automatic oiling system here. Uh, I've, for now, I've left the wires really long, so I've got a bit of scope to change them. And to be honest, I'm going to redo the solder joints on the motors because I've made a bright pig's ear of them. Um, but this is all just a bit of a test, to be honest. I'm just wanting to check that the motors actually work. Um, it'll be a bit noisy because we're on a hard worktop, which is going to act a bit like a soundboard. Uh, and also there's no oil in the prop shaft as yet, so expect some noise. But let's have a look. So that's forward. Now, in reverse, I'm expecting the central propeller to remain still because of my diode in the way. So, forward again. Reverse. Lovely. Splendid. Right, let's make it a bit neater. So, by way of an update of what I've done since the last video, uh, the automatic oiling system is now finished and in place. Um, I am going to put an oil filter in the top, but I haven't done that as yet. Uh, but we've got the three silicon tubes leading directly to the holes in the prop shafts, and that's nice and convenient. The tubes are quite discreet, they don't take up any space. There's a nice amount of sort of... Uh, distance in height between the bottom of the feeder and the prop shaft, so there shouldn't be any problem with gravity pulling the oil down into them. Uh, so I'm really happy with that. As yet, I haven't put any oil in. Um, reason for that is that I'm actually in the process of doing up my garden at the minute, and my idea is that once it's done, I'll put a big shed in there, and that will be my workshop. But until that's done, uh, my workshop is my living room, and I would be absolutely mortified if any oil dripped from the shafts down onto my new carpet. So until I'm in my actual workshop, uh, I'm not gonna put any oil anywhere near the boat. Um, other stuff that I've done, I've finally bit the bullet and bought a proper nice 3D printed rudder. I was sort of thinking for a long time about this and I, I put up with the rudder in the trumpeter kit, which I think I've mentioned it before, but the rudder you get in the trumpeter kit is actually not quite the right shape. It's um, its profile isn't quite correct, um, and I put up with it for a while. But then I just, it just, I just sort of thought, you know, I'm spending so much time trying to make an accurate model, um, but there's going to be such a glaring error at the end of it. And it's one of those things that you know, even if nobody else spotted it, I would spot it, and it would irritate me. Um, so I just bit the bullet and bought one. And to be fair, it's absolutely lovely. The, the quality of the printing on it is so nice, um, and it really does nail the profile of the rudder so much better than the trumpeter one does. So I'm really happy with that. The other bit of rationale, I suppose, is that I've spoken to a few people who've made this kit into an RC, um, and all of them have said that the rudder is essentially useless. Um, and it did occur to me that this rudder gives you slightly more surface area beneath the water than the other rudder would. So it, it did occur to me that 
that at least would slightly improve the performance of the rudder as well. It's probably going to be a fairly negligible difference, but every little helps, I suppose. I've attached it in the same way I attached the other one. Um, I don't see any point in showing it because it's a fairly long drawn out process and it's exactly the same process that I did last time, but it's attached in exactly the same way. Um, and it's got a nice boss coming out into the hole, which I can attach my servo mount onto. So that's really good. Uh, another job I need to do in the near future is I need to paint these nuts anti-fouling red. I uh, haven't got around to that yet, but I do mean to do it because at the minute it, it looks fairly obvious that the props are attached with with big nuts and I'd prefer them to be a bit more subtle. So that's another job I need to do in the relatively near future. Uh, the only other little job that I've done is I have started to uh, drill out and profile the hose pipe at the front. So that is coming along quite nicely. Uh, once it's done, I will fill the back with a wee bit of UV resin just to make sure it's all waterproof. Um, and I do intend as well in the near future on painting the inside of the anchor ports in red. Uh, I did note the comments that people said in the last video on that. Um, so there you are though, that's all of the updates I have since the last video. So that's it for this video. I haven't really covered any more ground to show you yet. Hopefully you enjoyed it. I appreciate it was quite technical this one and not a huge amount of actual modeling going on so I guess some people might find that a wee bit dry but hopefully when the next video comes out I'll have some more progress to show you I'm hoping to get things like the lights installed in the next one and also hopefully gonna try to start properly finalizing my electronics as in finishing off the design and getting them all installed into the boat and I'll hopefully in the near future start working on the decking and some of the real, the more sort of modelling side of the project. So um, that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you've got any comments or any questions like that, whack them down below and I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, if you've enjoyed it, please give us a like and maybe think about subscribing. And I will see you in the next one. Bye for now.